Greetings and welcome to Lecture 3, Atlantic Revolutions. One of the immediate consequences of the Seven Years' War was financial hardship in Great Britain. While the British had won the Seven Years' War, the victory had been very expensive, with Britain's national debt doubling in seven years. The resulting hardship led to several events that would have profound consequences, and a number of which would contribute to the outbreak of the American Revolution. One of these was the first direct taxation of the colonies. In the century and a half since the founding of Jamestown, the British had derived their income from the access to cheap natural resources and captive markets for manufactured goods that the colonies provided, along with the revenue raised by the, Na the Navigation Acts, which forced all colonial shipping to go through British merchants, shipping lines, and ports. In accordance with the Treaty of Par Paris that ended the Seven Years' War, France had evacuated North America, although it later reacquired a position on the continent when it acquired the Louisiana Territory from Spain. France's Indian allies in the struggle, especially in the Great Lakes region, had enjoyed a good relationship with the French, who had largely respected their local sovereignty and property rights. This changed under British administration. An alliance of tribes rose under a local leader of the Ottawa leader Pontiac and the resulting war known as Pontiac's Rebellion had contributed to the ongoing violence and expense even as Britain sought to stabilize itself financially. Following Pontiac's Rebellion, King George III, attempting to limit the costs of maintaining the security of its American colonies, issued the Proclamation of 1763. Proclamation prohibited expansion of the British colonies any further west, passed a, long drawn, passed a line drawn through the Appalachian Mountains, through western Pennsylvania and New York, ending in western Nova Scotia. George III hoped that the proclamation would end the conflict with the Native American tribes on the western frontier by, placing, by placating the tribe's fear of colonial encroachment on tribal lands. However, many of the elite of the Virginia gentry, to whom the measure of status were the amount of money one had, the number of slaves one owned, and the amount of land one owned, were deeply invested in real estate speculation west of the Appalachians, including George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and George Mason. Washington was a particularly avid land speculator. By the time of his death, he had, he had amassed more than 50,000 acres. All of these men, the elite of the Virginia gentry, faced the certainty of huge losses, if not outright financial ruin, if the Proclamation of 1763 were allowed to stand. In this way, then, the Proclamation of 1763 created a powerful incentive for the elite English colonists in the Middle, Coast, middle Chesapeake area colony of Virginia to revolt. There were also incentives for poor and working class farmers to join the revolutionary cause. The same navigation acts, which had created revenue from the colonies without the need for direct taxation, had had another effect, the impoverishment of the farmers. The navigation acts ma mandated that colonial exports had to be shipped on British ships. This gave British shipping lines carte blanche to charge exorbitant shipping rates and punitive interest rates on outstanding balances. For many small Virginia tobacco farmers, Every shipment put the farmer deeper in debt, creating a cycle of ever-increasing debt from which the farmer was unlikely to ever escape. With the possibility of revolt came the possibility that the debt could be repudiated or retired, bringing large numbers of small and medium-sized Virginia farmers into the ranks of supporters of revolt against Great Britain. The conduct of the war itself is beyond the scope of this class, but it illustrates some important dynamics. First, one may have noticed that the British, while losing the war, won most of the battles. This is a phenomenon that will be repeated throughout the wars of decolonization in later centuries, and it reveals a truth about insurgent warfare against a foreign occupier. For the insurgents to ultimately prevail, they do not need to win battles in the traditional sense. Instead, to win, the insurgents have to simply survive and make the occupation bloody, expensive, and ultimately futile, and, eventually, the occupiers would go home. This pattern has re been repeated across centuries and continents, no matter the conflict, whether, whether it be against the French in Spain, Vietnam, or Algeria, the British in America, India, and Africa, or the U.S. in the Philippines, Vietnam, or Iraq. 
Certainly the U.S. won some critical victories in the revolution, especially the battles of Saratoga, which induced France to both recognize the U.S. and enter the war as a U.S. ally, thus internationalizing the conflict and gaining for the U.S. a powerful imperial ally and the Battle of Yorktown, where defeat convinced the British that the war was simply not worth the blood, expense, and destabilizing effects it was creating in other parts of the empire. This pattern, however, does not follow when the government is a domestic, homegrown tyranny, for the simple reason that the native tyrant has nowhere to withdraw to, and thus will fight to the death. In this case, then, the insurgent must eventually come down from the mountains or out of the jungle and defeat the regular military forces of the regime in battle. In the case of the, of the American Revolution, one can see both the grim survival of an outma outmatched insurgent force and, after the French intervention, the defeat of the British main force. The critical importance of the French intervention is on full display at the Battle of Yorktown. At this last battle of the Revolution, where Washington's Continental Army crushed the British forces under Lord Cornwallis, there were more French soldiers than American in his combined forces, and a French fleet off the coast was preventing the British Navy from rescuing Cornwallis's forces. The internationalization of the conflict also played an important part in convincing the British to let the mainland colonies go. While bogged down in a seemingly interminable ground war against a resourceful and determined opponent in North America, the British also faced colonial uprisings in Africa, India, and the all-important sugar islands of the Caribbean. Letting the mainland colonies go became a simple cost-benefit analysis, with the preservation of the larger empire the overriding consideration. The end of the American Revolution also saw some revenge for the French loss in the Seven Years' War, but it had cost France dearly. France had already been in difficult financial straits from the Seven Years' War, and the American intervention had only added to that. In addition, the Americans had immediately negotiated a separate peace with Great Britain, gaining for far more for itself than it would have had it remained in a deal with its allies, France and Spain. Britain was willing to offer such favorable terms for several reasons. Spain and France were both global imperial rivals of Britain, while the U.S. was not, and splitting the U.S. off from France and Britain weakened both of them while positioning the U.S. to become an important British trading partner. The relationship between the American Revolution and the French Revolution that followed shortly afterwards has been debated by historians for almost two centuries. Surely, given their proximity in time and the common actors, there was some connection, but the exact extent of it is unclear. The French state, already hurting financially, gained little from the war in America beyond national pride while going even deeper in debt. However, the French state also had deeper structural problems, such as lingering feudalism and extreme inequality. France simultaneously faced crises in agriculture, industry, commerce, and finance, while facing deep hostility from the workers and peasants upon whom the burden of taxation fell. So, while the American Revolution exacerbated the problems facing France, the American Revolution was not solely responsible for the outbreak of revolution in France. It was one cause among several. It is fascinating to compare the two, as both were revolutions based on Enlightenment ideals and Republican principles, yet took such drastically different paths. The United States progressed through a mostly peaceful process of consolidation from the loose alliance of states envisioned by the Articles of Confederation to the strong national government created by the Constitution, while the French Revolution proceeded through a period of conflict between reformers and conservatives to the onset of the terror, chaos, dictatorship, and yet another global war. The details of the French Revolution are beyond the scope of this lecture, but some highlights need to be understood. After the king convened a gathering called the Estates General, composed of representatives of the three so-called Estates of French society, the clergy, the nobility, and the people, in hopes of addressing the financial crisis, the process rapidly spiraled beyond his control. The people formed a national assembly that proclaimed a French republic, the king was provisionally suspended by the legislature, and a governing national convention was declared.
in one of the iconic moments in French history, a large armory and prison in Paris, the Bastille, was stormed by the people, freeing the prisoners and arming the revolutionaries. In the foreign arena, Austria and Prussia immediately declared war on the French Republic, uh, intending to reinstate the French monarchy, fearing the example that a successful revolution would set for their own people. Amid all this, the revolutionaries produced a statement of principles that became one of the highlights of the evolution of the Western liberal democratic tradition, the Declaration of Man and Citizen. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen is also probably the strongest tangible connection between the American and French revolutions. The Declaration was authored by French cleric and political theorist Abbe Sieyès and the Marquis de Lafayette in consultation with Thomas Jefferson, the author of the Declaration of Independence. Lafayette was a young French nobleman who had come to America during the Revolution to fight the British and had become a close friend of both Washington and Jefferson. The Declaration was based on, and bears a strong resemblance to, the American Declaration of Independence. It was rapidly adopted as a founding document of the French Republic and remains in force today, having been carried through multiple revolutions, in spite of a glaring omission it shared with the Declaration of Independence, a clear statement on the rights and status of women. This om omission did not go unremarked. It was famously noted and denounced by Olympe de Gouges, a playwright and political activist. De Gouges had written in support of abolition before the revolution and had supported the early revolution. But the revolution had faced strong opposition from conservatives and royalists internally, and declarations of war from Austria and Prussia who meant to restore the French monarchy from abroad. As chaos spread, the National Convention appointed the Committee of Public Safety, which served as the de facto government of the French Republic during the next, most radical phase of the French Revolution, the Great Terror of 1792 to 1794. The Terror was a campaign of mass terror and public executions meant to rid France of so-called counter-revolutionaries, enemies of the revolution, enemies of the state, enemies of the people, enemies of the republic, most of the French nobility, and anyone else deemed a threat or a dissident by the Committee of Public Safety, led by Maximilien Robespierre, the so-called incorruptible. The principal tool of the terror was the guillotine, and at its gruesome peak, the guillotines of Robespierre and the Committee for Public Safety were publicly beheading hundreds of people daily in the public square of Paris. It took very little to draw the attention of the extremists on the Committee of Public Safety, or the suspicion of a popula population radicalized by terror, as Olympe de Gouges and so many others discovered. De Gouges' criticism of the revolutionaries took two tracks. The first was a general criticism of the presumptuous founding of a republic without putting it to a vote. De Gouges would have per preferred the people decide whether they wanted a republic, or a constitutional monarchy, or a parliament, or some other form of democracy, rather than it simply being decided by the representatives on the National Assembly. Second, in response to the omission of any mention of women in the Declaration of Man and Citizen, Olympe de Gouges authorized, authored the Declaration of the Rights of Woman and Citizen, which rewrote the earlier document to be inclusive of women, producing one of the most significant statements in women's history between the Renaissance-era writings of Christine de Passant and the writings of Mary Wollstonecraft that preceded the emergence of first-wave feminism in the 19th century in Britain and America. What followed is one of the great illustrative moments in the Western feminist tradition. While the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen was hailed as a timeless statement of the Western democratic tradition, the very same document, rewritten to include women, was seen as a harsh critique of a revolutionary government that did not suffer criticism. Combined with her criticism of the extremists in the revolutionary movement, her criticism of the lack of democratic processes and the executions of Louis the Sixteenth and Queen Marie Antoinette, and the terror itself, the Revolutionary Tribunal condemned Olympe de Gouges, and she was executed on the guillotine on November 3rd, 1793. At the same time, in Paris, Mary Wollstonecraft avoided arrest during the terror, and her writings from the time, combined with de Gouges, were later read by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott, and thus made an important contribution to the emergence of first-wave feminism.
take a moment and read a comparison of some of the highlights of the two documents and see what you think. The end of the terror and the brutal repression of the left that had ran it during the so-called Thermidorian reaction ushered in a new phase of the revolution, one characterized by repeated failings to establish governments that could stabilize France while prosecuting the war abroad. Ironically, during this period, the French army performed well. As more nations joined the war against France, a new and unifying ideal emerged, nationalism. The French Revolution saw the birth of nationalism as a unifying principle. It may seem counterintuitive as the American Revolution had preceded it, but in America, identity was much more closely bound to one's state. Nationalism as a unifying force in the United States didn't really become a powerful social force until after the American Civil War of 1861 to 1865. Nationalism became another of the enduring political legacies of the French Revolution, along with its contribution to modern feminism. France's mobilization for total war was yet another revolution of another sort. The republican ideals of liberty, fraternity, equality, animated by fervent nationalism, made it possible for, for France to induce to introduce universal conscription in 1793 and enabled it thus to build armies of unprecedented size for the war against the group of nations arrayed against it. This put the other nations of Europe at a, serious, at a disadvantage as they could not risk arming their entire populations for fear that those populations would overthrow them instead of fighting the French. The French government seized factories and farms, set prices and wages, and took what it wanted at prices it agreed to pay. It was the mobilization of an entire society for war, and the end of that period of limited war that had existed since the end of the Thirty Years' War in 1648. During the war, a French officer of Italian Corsican descent distinguished himself repeatedly, first by violently suppressing a revolt of royalist counter-revolutionaries in Paris and then fighting the Austrians in Italy. The victory in Italy and establishment of friendly republics there that followed the victory made Napoleon Bonaparte a hero in France. He then led an expedition to Egypt. Afterwards, in 1799, Napoleon overthrew the French government and made himself the first consul of the republic, the effective dictator of France in all but name and Napoleon didn't squander the opportunity. Before his career was over, he would make himself one of the most influential people in the history of Western civilization. Napoleon was a brilliant military commander, but his influence went far beyond his military victories. As historian Andrew Roberts wrote, the ideas that underpin our modern world, meritocracy, equality before the law, property rights, religious toleration, modern secular education, sound finances, and so on, were championed, consolidated, codified, and geographically extended by Napoleon. To them, he added a rational and efficient local administration, an end to rural banditry, the encouragement of science and the arts, the abolition of feudalism, and the greatest codification of laws since the fall of the Roman Empire." End quote. However, the process by which Napoleon graphically extended this vision was war and conquest, and in, in Europe, the wars against Napoleon consumed much of the next 20 years after he seized power in 1799, and especially after he declared himself Emperor Napoleon I of the French Empire in 1804. After selling the vast Louisiana territory to the United States, and failing to suppress the slave rebellion that created the free nation of Haiti, Napoleon's forces conquered most of the rest of Europe from the Atlantic to the western boundary of the Russian Empire. 
When Napoleon invaded Russia in 1812, it was with an army of more than 650,000 soldiers, the largest army in, Euro in European history till then. Russian forces refused to stand and fight a decisive battle, instead fighting and then withdrawing and employing so-called scorched earth tactics and drawing French forces deeper into Russia. Crops were bur burned, wells poisoned, and animals killed, all to deny the French the ability to live off the land. All of their supplies would have to be brought over their supply lines. And as Napoleon's army plunged, deep, plunged deeper into the vast steppe country of Russia, its supply lines became unmanageably long and impossible to defend against Russian attacks in the areas behind the army. The onset of the brutal Russian winter, where temperatures routinely fell below 30 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, met the end of meant the end of Napoleon's campaign in Russia. Subsequent efforts of the Grand Army would be to get out of Russia alive. By the time Napoleon crossed the border back into friendly territory, only about 27,000 of the 650,000 plus soldiers that had marched into Russia that summer with him had survived. It would be three more years before Napoleon's final defeat at Waterloo. He had been briefly exiled before returning, reclaiming the throne, and relaunching the war one last time. His second exile would be his last. Following Waterloo, the Bourbon monarchy was restored to the throne of France, not recognizing that the, the days of the divine right kings in Western Europe were almost over. France would be beset by wars and coups d'etat in re subsequent years. One of them would be led by Napoleon's nephew, who had himself crowned as Napoleon III in 1852 and proclaiming the Second French Empire, which was ultimately crushed in battle in 1871 by the Prussians in the Franco-Prussian War during the Wars of German Unification. Following Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo in exile, a conference was convened, the Congress of Vienna. The purpose of this conference was to end the nearly constant warfare of the previous century and a half, the so-called Second Hundred Years' War, and to address issues that had arisen in the wake of the French Revolution. France was stripped of all of the territory it had conquered in Europe, while Russia, Prussia, and Austria all gained territory. Accepting the wars of German unification between 1865 and 1871, the Congress of Vienna framework framework worked out in 1815 worked remarkably well for almost a century until German troops marched into Belgium in 1914 and kicked off World War I. There were other effects. Napoleon's ambitions in Europe had preoccupied him and motivated him to both sell the Louisiana territory of the United States and to refrain from the kind of military action in Haiti that might have preserved French control of that extremely val valuable sugar colony. For Spain, though, Defeat and occupation by Napoleonic France had made it impossible for Spain to control much of its empire in the Americas while it was preoccupied with the, its own occupation, and an entire cascade of revolutions followed in Spanish America, beginning with Argentina in 1816, Chile in 1818, Colombia 1819, Mexico 1821, Peru 1821, Brazil from Port became independent from Portugal in 1822, Ecuador in 1822, and Bolivia in 1825, and Venezuela in 1830. At the same time, there were revolutions in the Safavid Empire in Persia, the Mughal Empire in India, Islamic revolutions in West Africa, a Wahhabist uprising in the Ottoman Empire, peasant uprisings in Russia, and rebellions in China. It was an age of revolution. Napoleon passed away in exile on the remote island of St. Helena in the South Atlantic on May 5, 1821, his place in history secure.